Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Open Up the Workforce, where we speak with leaders driving the future of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Today, I'm joined by Troy McIntosh, the Vice President and Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer at IDEX. Troy is also a member of the Executive Leadership Council and has been working in this industry in diversity, equity, and inclusion for some time. And I truly look to Troy as a pioneer. Troy, would you tell our listeners a little bit more about your background and what's led you to your current role today? Thank you. Thank you very much, Avin. Thank you for having me. This is exciting to get together. So I've been in this work of diversity for a little over 10 years, but I started working in leader development. I actually held a couple of roles at places like United Airlines and Abbott Laboratories. And so the nature of the work of leadership development always includes how to accelerate leaders. And as I progressed in my career in talent and leadership, one of the things I found was I just had a passion around equity. So the work that I did always included equity and diversity, whether it was training people on equity and diversity or ensuring that there was equity in the programs that I have, I was responsible for developing. And then at some point in my career, I started getting calls, asked about perhaps getting in diversity. And I wasn't really sure if that's what I wanted to do, but kind of reflected and realized that it was really a, it was really a theme in my career. As a matter of fact, when I went to graduate school, I did work on social equity. So it's just been a natural progression in my career because I believe in supporting people that haven't been heard. Thank you for sharing. And that's why we were so excited to connect with you. When we started building Simba, it was really around this notion of social equity. And we kind of at Simba started from the ground up as far as access to the workplace when we think of like early careers and internships. But I know your focus is around leadership development. Are there any differences or similarities that you think there are between maybe focusing on leadership and inclusion versus maybe early careers that you could share with our audience? I'll say yes and no. Some of the same barriers that students or early career folks encounter, people later in their career also encounter, right? So whether it's bias or lack of mentorship and sponsorship or lack of support or just kind of understanding how to navigate the corporate environment, I think the challenges are similar. I will say that probably more companies have focus on early career and internship, whereas when it gets later in career, I think maybe fewer companies have specific programmatic approaches to that. One thing I will say is that some of the challenges that women and people of color have in progressing in corporate America, like like one of the key challenges is just making sure that you get the feedback people have for you so you can implement that feedback. I'd say that it gets it gets less likely the more senior you get for a person to get the right feedback. And that's feedback is absolutely integral to being able to progress and improve in your career. I couldn't agree more, especially as a young leader myself, that feedback has changed how I've grown and developed and navigated my career, even at the very early stages. As you are developing and designing this strategy at IDEX, I know that you've been able to design and work on this across different organizations, but here at IDEX, you're building it somewhat from scratch and really bringing the whole organization together around a playbook and a concept. Can you share a little bit more about how you're doing that, kind of the progress you're at today? Right, right, right. Yes. Like I said, so there was a previous person who led diversity who I talked to before I took this role. But I would say that in terms of our building out the strategy, it's been kind of from the ground up. There's four elements to our strategy. The first element deals with ensuring that people that are involved with diversity work have the correct mindset. We firmly believe that this work requires a certain level of engagement. It requires self-reflection. It requires some humility. So we actually put our leaders and our the people that want to be a part of our work, whether it's resource group folks, we actually put them through some assessments to help to coach them on beginning to think about their own cultural competence, their own self-awareness, and hopefully to build a sense of humility. So we spend time in the beginning helping people to think through mindset. The second piece of our strategy deals with amplifying underrepresented voices, right? So making sure that we can move the organization as leaders to be a, to do a better job of listening to those that are traditionally underrepresented. So that includes our resource groups, but it also includes a number of external partnerships with groups like Society of Women Engineers or National Black MBA, as an example, ASE, and a number of different groups that we've partnered with in the past to really kind of 
improve our ability to listen to those that have traditionally been excluded. Third part of our strategy deals with inclusive leadership development. So we build out a set of inclusion leadership competencies. We have a training program. We have a person who leads training that focuses solely on developing people in the area of inclusion. And the third leg of our strategy focuses on the results, all the equity results, right? So whether it's talent equity results, pay equity results, ensuring we have deep penetration with our resource group. So we have a number of tools that have been developed around really building those metrics. And so we spent about a year building out that strategy. One of the things I think is really cool about the work at IDEX is it is absolutely vertically integrated. So when I say we built this strategy out, that means that the CEO is in line with it. The executive leadership team is in line with it. They co-created it. And maybe I'd even say most importantly, our board. We spend a lot of time discussing our strategy with our board. They monitor what we're doing. They provide me feedback, the CEO feedback. So we spent a lot of time in year one getting aligned. And now in year two, what we're doing is we've actually built out a playbook. It's aligned with those four areas of strategies, and we're working business to business across IDEX because IDEX is actually a group of about 45 different unique business units and working with those local leadership teams and those local GMs and presidents and helping them to integrate the strategy and bring it to their local teams. That's awesome. I mean, I think that anyone listening in to hear that even the board is involved and that Mm -hmm. aligned, that's incredible. I mean, how do we get to that point? And was that something that was just innate within IDEX? Was it something that you had to really foster and amplify and cultivate? What advice might you have for others? That's a good question. So I'll just say no. I When I joined, it was a commitment of our CEO and our executive leadership team to build it that way. They started with a DEI task force that was built across the senior team. But one of the things that they wanted to do in the beginning was to make sure that the board got involved. And so our board has been lockstep. As a matter of fact, I'd say some of the things that the board has done The board has actually improved their diversity, right? They've made sure that they've brought diversity into the slate. So as the board has began to turn over, they've done a better job of including diversity in their slate. They've actually increased both racial and gender diversity on our board. So so what's happened is our board is more diverse and we have a more diverse board. We also have a number of board members that are involved with DEI work at their companies. So we have some... We have some board leaders, right, that have a strong passion for diversity and actually come from companies that have excellent diversity practice. So what they did, this is before I started, they built it into the proxy that every every board meeting has to have a discussion on diversity. So I end up presenting, I'm actually one of the only folks, who, the CEO, obviously, and the finance leader do as well, but I'm one of the only members of the EO of the executive leadership team that presents to the board at every meeting. So they hold me accountable. We hold one another accountable. They push me, frankly. They they push me and push the organization and make sure that we reach the results that we aspire to. That's fascinating and really awesome, right? The fact that the chief diversity officer, the CEO, and the CFO, right? If the, these are kind of like the trifecta of an organization, that is so powerful. I'll follow up. What are you presenting on during these board meetings? Are they metrics? What are What's top of mind for everybody? It's really all the above. So it depends on when the meeting is, but typically once a year, there's sort of a co-presentation with myself and the head of HR on our talent approach, right? So that, that includes talent metrics, but it also includes work around our successor pool and high potential mix. So that's looking at equity at that senior level. I say at, at the majority of the meetings, I spend, I do spend time talking about metrics. So our, our CEO, our executive team and our, all of our senior leaders, we have about, this is like the top 400 or so people that are incented through our stock plan. All of those folks have a metric on diversity. So they all have a representation metric. So I'll report out on that because it's one of the things that our executives get evaluated on, including my boss. Obviously he gets evaluated, evaluated on that. And then we spend time talking about a number of initiatives. So the initiative I just mentioned to you about the playbook, that's one of the things that we talked about. We talk about resource groups, upcoming meeting. I'm going to share a little bit about our diversity outreach. We're in the fall where we have this outreach approach where we go to Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers and SWE and National Black MBA. So we report out on that. So there's a number of things, but it's nearly always a conversation about metrics, but also a number of programmatic things that we're involved with. 
during the course of the year. Thank you for sharing. I hope that others can implement this as well. It's really fascinating, exciting to see that this is happening at the board level. Yeah. As you've been designing this and putting together some of these initiatives, has anything surprised you along the journey? Yeah. So I will say that this I've worked at this level at a couple other companies and I've had some exposure to the board. Best my last company, I spent a fair amount of time meeting with the board. This was post George Floyd, but I will say that this is no disrespect to any other company. I would say my role was more education focused, like helping the board to understand what DEI looked like. I would say one of the things I'm surprised by is how in- deeply engaged our board is with diversity. There's maybe nine or 10 people. I'd say nearly every time I meet with them, I take a question from everyone, the whole <laughs> It's like the whole board has a question, and it's different questions. Look, that's been a great development opportunity for me to have regular board involvement. Presenting to a board is very different than delivering a training or even working with your internal. I mean, it's just another level of engagement. But I will say, hey, there's a guarantee that this work is sustainable at this company because the board outlasts even the CEO in some cases, right? So you've got this level of support. The chief of our board is a woman. Right. I mean, there's just a lot of engagement. And I'd say that's one of the things that surprised me. I'll say it's a pleasant surprise because it's the first time I've ever been challenged by. Right. Like usually in my role, you're challenging the CEO. You're like most of the time my role is convincing the CEO to push harder or convincing the board to be more engaged. This is not this is like they're typically changing me. And I'm saying, hey, like, I think there's some things we could do. Hey, let's make sure that we have a, a balanced approach, but I love the fact that they're challenging me and pushing me all the time. That's a great part of the game. Yes. And it's great to hear that they're involved with diversity, equity, inclusion at their own respective companies. And we see that Gen Z and the new generation of talent, they are very excited about working at companies that have a purpose, that they demonstrate their, their corporate social values. And I think that part of that means actually going to research who sits on the board. What does the board look like and what are the board's priorities, not just what's on the website? So I think that's a really powerful notion for us to all kind of take away is as we're interviewing the company and employer we want to work for, uh, what does the board look like and not just the website and the marketing and some of that online? That's great. I mean, that's one of the things that we mentioned in our sustainability report. I'd say it's something that we, if I were to say, here's an opportunity for other leaders who recruit for IDEX to accentuate, it's one of the things I would accentuate because it's actually a pretty unique. I mean, I have a lot of other chief diversity officer friends and we talk about this is I'm maybe the only one that I know that I'm spending this much time with the board and that the board is so I wouldn't even use the word receptive. I would say they are fully engaged and pushing to make sure that we follow like receptive sounds like I'm pitching something to them trying to get their buy-in. That's not the nature of the relationship. It's not what it's like at our company. It's like the board is actively involved in many ways, actually. As an example, like we just had our second inclusion summit. We have a company-wide two-day summit that focuses on inclusion development. And the whole board is like, hey, like, can you send me the uh, videos? Like they want to attend. Like we have board members that show up at these events. It's a virtual event, but we have high board member involvement in the event. Wow, this is really exciting. And yeah, it's we've really, had this show really, throughout this year, and we've had a lot of chief diversity officers speak. And that's why I'm asking so many questions, even though we weren't even planning to talk about the right, board at all. But right, right. I just think this is so, so powerful and fantastic to have top down support for this. Do you have any advice and thoughts for maybe chief diversity officers that are trying to get this level of buy-in and support? Maybe what might they do if they don't have it innately woven in? Right, right. So, yeah, I mean, I would say that start with the CEO because the board is the CEO's boss, right? And the extent to which the CEO can influence the board around what's strategically important. I'd say the thing that makes it a little bit easier for us is that my CEO, my my boss thinks about this as an integrated part of the business. It's just the way he thinks about the business, right? I'll give you an example. We have a number of, every year we have a number of change initiatives that are sort of breakthrough pieces. Last year, our focus was on things like 
customer involvement and digitization. We are operations companies. So there's opportunity for growth and us understanding how to better integrate digital and sort of forward thinking solutions. And also we launched a new approach to strategy last year. Right? And so our, D, our CEO held a session for the whole company with the chief strategist, who's a woman, with and with the person who's over digitization. And one of one of the themes that he brought through is it's impossible to do this work without leaders that fundamentally understand and implement inclusion. Because the nature of what we want to do around innovation, how we want to approach strategy requires leaders that think about inclusion in a very active way, right? Because inclusion deals with bringing best thinking to your most complicated problems, right? Those are really complex problems. And so he basically explained, like, this is what I'm looking for from the leadership teams. I'm looking for when you have a project, I want to know who's on that project and have you thought out of the box about how you bring that different thinking to that complexity, right? So it's the way that he thinks about things. So, so if a CEO begins to manage their organization like this, leaders eventually get the message that, hey, this is what's expected. So I would just say start with the CEO and my CEO tends to integrate it into the work that we do. So it's the way that he manages the organization. And that's the, I mean, on the flip side, if your CEO is not supportive, it's virtually impossible to push diversity work forward. It's a really important. And I think to your point, also not only inclusion, but also diversity, right? If you have yes. diversity of thinking, you can yes. inspire creativity, you inspire dissent. As I was building our startup team for the first time, our my mentor said, Abba, bring somebody on that has completely different skill set and a completely different way of thinking than you do. Right. Right. And at first that was a little, it was challenging, right? Because that means that as you make decisions, you might get more pushback. You might have to think through things, but then we, it was enabling us to become much more creative and inspire innovation. And speaking of innovation, we saw in 2020 that you launched a collegiate talent program, and we'd love to learn just a little bit more about it. It's the Accelerating Management Potential program, and we've seen a lot of diversity come through it. Can you tell us a little bit more about that program and its significance in developing your future leaders? Yeah, so one of the things that was cool about that, so this was started before I started, but we've had a lot of alignment because what they found was the way that program was launched, actually, it was launched a lot through diverse recruiting, right? So lots of on-site recruiting through groups like National Black MBA, Nesby, SHIP, right? And so we started with that on-site work. That program is a rotational program. So it starts with it starts with leaders join the organization, but then they actually get rotated twice. They get sent to different locations. And along the rotation process, they also get support. So my team does some work with them. We actually do some coaching and have an introduction session with them. But they're actually being rotated to learn more about the organization. And it's broken into different functions. There's op, We're an ops company, so we always have an ops engineering focus where most of our leaders have who have become GMs or presidents have an operational background, but it also includes finance folks and HR folks. So one of the things I think I'm most excited about is that there was great partnership with the talent team because a lot of how they built that program out dealt with working closely with the local chapters of some of those organizations, Nesby, SHIP, right, in getting the initial folks involved with that program. It's been really successful. That's great to hear. And those are types of programs that we get really excited about because we yeah. know it enables young, excited talent get their foot in the door. Oftentimes, there's a lot of support and mentorship and wraparound support to enable success long term. How do you think about measuring success of this program? Because I know you have a lot of different initiatives on your plate. How do you, what are the metrics maybe you need to know high level and how do you keep allocating resources for a program like this? Right. So this program doesn't, isn't ran out of my group, but, but what I do when it comes to any HR program, <laughs> like, like what I do every time, I'm there to ask equity questions, right? So I'm usually involved, but it's more around equity. And when I say equity, I mean, What's the throughput? So how many folks are actually getting promoted? Who's being retained? How diverse is the cohort, right? So what's the level of retention of that cohort? Has the, have the members of that cohort 
continue to be viewed as quality hires, right? So are they performing at a high level? So my team's been able to build some great relationships. We actually continue to get folks from those programs involved with recruiting. Because when we go back to like National Black MBA and Nesby and SHIP and SWEEP, very often a lot of people that participate are people that are from those programs because they're so, because they're, they've all graduated in the last five years, right? So, so my team typically is asking and monitoring those sorts of metrics around equity and just ensuring that we see not only hiring, right? But progression, right? Like that's what we're looking for. Who is progressing? And are there areas in our company where there are bottlenecks to progression, right? And helping to get those things fixed, which is kind of where the playbook work comes in. One of the things that we partnered with our HR team last year was building out a HR diversity dashboard. So the dashboard includes all these sorts of metrics, right? Metrics around who, who's growing in the organization, what those performance metrics look like. And so now we can work with each of our individual businesses on tracking the progress of that talent in the organization. That's fantastic to hear, especially I love what you said about progression, right? It's not just about getting your foot in the door. No, How do we ensure no, that not. you grow and develop within the organization? Right. It's absolutely, I mean, it's, I mean, it's both, but you can't, I mean, so we think of it all the way from like the applicant pool. We're like, who's being out? Who's applying? Who's being interviewed? Who's being hired? But then who is, who's progressing? Everything from interviews to who's getting roles. And I thought one of the things that I would say, while we do track roles vertically, we want to see roles up in the, people moving up in the organization. I will say one of the things that's really important, a really important a part of career development is lateral moves, right? which I think probably in the diverse diversity community, we could probably talk about more. That at the end of more at the back side of your career, the more experience you can gather, even if it is a lateral move. I know sometimes people want to know, well, how much more money is this? And is this a higher management level? All that's important. I'm not saying that isn't important. But I will say many of the executives that I've talked to, one of the things that's distinctive is that they've probably taken more lateral moves because ver- because when you take a lateral move, you actually still get a lot of experience or even special assignments and special projects. So it's a little bit more difficult to track things like that. But my feedback to aspiring talent is, hey, when somebody asks you to be on a project, like say yes, like just say yes. Even if you're not, you might not get paid more, but you're going to you're going to gain something you can put on your resume. You can go take that project and kill it. And the next time you have an interview, you have a broader set of experiences that you can share, which is kind of how I ended up being in diversity work. I probably led, I don't know, eight to 10 diversity projects before I ever had a diversity title, like at other companies. I just, hey, will you help with it? Yeah, I'll do it. I'll help with that. I love that advice. And I myself, I studied economics and human rights. I never envisioned myself in a tech role running a tech organization, but being open to those shifts and having that mindset is so important, especially as we think about how the workplace is being disrupted now where upskilling and reskilling and lateral movements that might actually just be required because where certain roles are being displaced and we might just need to move that talent over. You mentioned the HR diversity dashboard, which is Awesome. That sounds like it was a lot of work to build. What are some of the key things you're looking at? And maybe what are the teams that are involved in putting that together? That's a great question. So it was like my team supported with it. This was a function of our HRS team. They did an amazing job. So it's a dash, it's a dashboard that was built in Workday, right? So everything from when an employee hires and they make their, they self identify. Right. In terms of their ident, their identification, their ethnicity, their gender, things like that. And so the, the dashboard is able to track our organization by management level, by promotion, by business unit, by functional unit. And so it's, it gives our DEI team and all of our HR folks and our business leaders ability to kind of drive deep into the organization and see how diversity is progressing. So you can do it by date. You could go, okay, I want to see where we've moved from beginning of 2023 to the current time. And this is actually the way that I keep the organization and the board 
abreast of what's happening, right, is by monitoring it this way. It was built by the HRS team. I mean, I'm just like, kudos to that squad. I mean, they work with us. They work with us. Like my team was like, here's how we'd like to see it designed. But they actually built it. So it's really like all credit to HR. I mean, HR and DEI partnership is absolutely integral. Like if you don't have... If you don't have support from your HR team, you can't do diversity. It's just, you just can't. It just won't happen. So I just, this was like big kudos to the HR team because they did all of the heavy lifting. We just threw out requests. The DEI team just said, we'd like to see this and that, and they just went and executed it. So great job by our HRS team. That's fascinating. And I feel like today you've shared so much about how D and I, how you have partnerships across the entire organization. And I think that's critical in this role altogether. I honestly wish I had more time with you because I have so <laughs> many more questions to ask, but I do want to wrap up with one of our questions that we ask all of our speakers on this show, which is around our mission at Simba, open up the workforce. To us at Simba, that means creating equitable access to jobs and wealth creation We'd love to get your perspective on on what are the next steps leaders need to take in order to open up the workforce. That's a great question. It's a great question. So so I love how you frame this around wealth creation. I mean, I'd even say in my own career, sort of helping others or people that have come from places like me, right? So I didn't come from I didn't come from a upper class background. I came from an inner city public school, right? Everybody in my family worked either worked in worked in the public sector, like they were teachers or my dad was a police officer or they worked at a they worked as like a they worked in a plant. Right. So I think what I learned was that there's a lot of education around how the corporate world works, how to develop a resume, like basic how to develop a resume how to interview, right? Questions around wealth, like when I was, I knew nothing about stock. I didn't know anything about bonuses. Like there are all these things that I just didn't understand that I think young professionals, if young professionals had mentorship and support around how all these things eventually get connected, the way you build your career, how you build your resume. I don't mean... When I say build your resume, I don't mean what goes on a sheet of paper. I mean, how you think about your accomplishments and how you accumulate work experiences, how you communicate those work experiences in a way that's compelling. These are things that nobody ever coached me. And then I realized, I mean, I'm telling you, I was older. I realized that I was competing against a bunch of people that had like friends and family members that just talked about this stuff all, all along. So I just think that there's a need for especially in black and brown communities and underrepresented communities to have these conversations and to provide that kind of professional support for emerging talent. And so I mean, that's kind of where my passion is. I actually came to this work. I Just the last thing I'll say is I came to the work of diversity way back in the day. I worked in, I was a social worker, actually. Like I worked at high schools. I worked with inner city youth and things like that. And just always had a passion for helping people to improve their state in life because of what people did for me. So that's kind of the essence of diversity work. But I think being able to be integrated around what happens in the work world and speak to people who need support around their overall development is really important to me. So hopefully that's the nature of the work that you're involved with at some Yes, that's what we're all about. And I'm so inspired by you, Troy. I feel like your background, everything that you've done, it is such a beautiful, powerful story. And I'm excited that others will hopefully learn from you and lead in your path and that we can do this more for others. I know that even as I developed in my career, I had so many questions. Both my parents were in medicine and engineering, and I was the first one to kind of take this path. So I had so many questions and mentorship was how I was able to learn through mistakes, through trial and error. So it is so important. And I resonate with what you're saying. Before we wrap up, Troy, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience and listeners today? No, I just want to, I want to thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. And the work is, the work is continuing. There's been a lot of, there's been a lot of, you know, recent news about DEI getting pushed back. I don't really think that's accurate. 
I think it's that, yeah, there were some companies that dove into diversity work that didn't really think of, they didn't count the cost. They didn't think about what it was going to require. And some of those companies have walked away now, but they probably were never that serious about it to begin with. I think actually the work of diversity is going to continue. And as the, especially as the U.S. and the global marketplace just becomes more diverse, it, there's just no way we're going to be able to progress as a country, as a globe without figuring out how we listen to one another better, support one another better, and actually create spaces where everyone can thrive versus only some of us. So that's what we're about. And I know that's the work of Simba as well. So thank you for having me up. Thank you so much for us. Wonderful having you on. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.